Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 All Connecticut Reads Virtual Author Launch. We're so happy to have everyone here. My name is Ashley Sklar, and I'm the Adult Services and Community Engagement Consultant with the Connecticut State Library. I'm just going to go over some housekeeping things, including Tim's aforementioned tip before we dive in. You may have noticed we are in Zoom webinar, so you do not need to worry about your audio or your video. We can't see you. You can just see and enjoy us. Um, we do um, invite you to use the chat to introduce yourself. You can tell us your school or your library or your organization or your book group or your hometown, if you like. Um, and use the chat throughout to comment and discuss and engage. Um, we, we, want, we want to see, we love an active chat. So, and again, make sure to direct it to everyone as opposed to the hosts and panelists, which probably is defaulting on yours so that we can all, all talk together. Um, with that also in mind, while the conversation happens in the chat, please post your questions for our authors in the Q&A feature, which you'll also find at the bottom of your screen. During each of their segments, that makes it much easier for our moderators to find your questions there and hopefully get to them asked. We have also, as you've probably noticed, turned on the live caption feature, so feel free to use and adjust that as you need to on your own screen. And you have probably also noticed that we are recording this evening's event um, and all the recordings will be made available on the All Connecticut Reads website. Give us about a week to do some editing and uh, chopping up and, and all of that and sharing and we'll, we'll get that out to you all. So about All Connecticut Reads, which probably most of you know about, but I'm going to tell you again anyway. This is a program of the Connecticut State Library and it is a year-long initiative to promote lifelong reading, learning and connection that uses a rotating community committee structure to select one main book title and three shortlist book titles for each calendar year for three age groups. We do kids ages eight to 12, teens ages 13 to 18, and one for adults as well. And in addition to all the titles that we give you, we also kind of provide a supported programmatic structure for Connecticut libraries or book discussion groups to use. You'll see that on each of the book pages of the website, you'll find a suite of discussion guides and podcasts and videos and articles um, for each of the titles, giving you lots of room to customize it, be creative, develop your own responsive programs or activities or questions, all kind of geared towards your audience, your community, make it what you want. Um, with that, I am pleased to turn the spotlight over to my colleague and partner on this initiative, Kim Bo. Take it away, Kim. Hi folks, my name is Kim Poe. I am the Children and Young Adult Consultant with the Connecticut State Library. My desk is next to Ashley's, even though we're never in the office at the same time. So you might be wondering why All CT Reads? Um, because, you know, we want a way to read together. We want continuous conversation. Um, we want to offer avenues um, for participation in big spaces and small spaces to talk about inclusivity, culture, acceptance, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, for those of you who hear that often. Uh, we want mystery and relationships. We want a lineup of books that looks just like the one we're going to show you for all books, all people, and all CT reads. Our kids' primary title for 2023 is Living with Viola by Rosanna Fung, who you all can see here and will be hearing from first tonight. Our shortlist titles are Barica Beats by Maliha Siddiqui, how to Find What You're Not Looking For by Vera Hiran and Dani, and The Leak, written by Kate Reed Petty and illustrated by Andrea Bell. A big thank you to our Kids Book Selection Committee, Jen Billingsley, Carrie Bryant, Chrissy, Chrissy Wagner, and Christine Zeiser. Our teen primary title selection for 2023 is Hollow Fires by Samira Ahmed, who will be joining us later today also. Our teen shortlist titles are All My Rage by Saba Tahir, In the Wild Life by Jeff Zetner, and I Must Betray You by Ruta Sepetis. A big, big thank you to our teen book selection committee, Eli Kelly, Jen Larkin, Alessandra Casiello, and Melissa Tom. Our adult primary selection for 2023 is the final revival of Opal and Nev by Donnie Walton, who will be our third speaker for this evening. Our adult shortlist titles are Radiant Fugitives by Nawaz Ahmed, When Women Were Dragons by Kelly Barnhill, and Olga Dies Dreaming by Sojil Gonzalez. 
And an equally big thank you to our adult book selection committee, Jennifer Cretion, Travis Fetter, Marion Huggins, Amara Johnson, and Marguerite Rausch. And the biggest of thank yous to our partners for this event, um, the Connecticut Library Consortium CLC, Amanda Stern is here with us and talking to y'all in the chat. CASEL, the Connecticut Association for School Librarians. I've already seen some CASEL board members in the chat. Thank y'all for joining us. Our sponsor, EBSCO, um, All CT Reads is supported by a generous grant from the EBSCO Information Services to the Connecticut Heritage Foundation. And one of the biggest thank yous to two of our biggest supporters in the chat, Don Laval, our D division director, um, Cool. You're in here, Don, right? I think. And Deborah Shonder, I believe I saw both of you, the Connecticut State Librarian who are joining us in the chat. Everyone say thank you to them because we couldn't do this without them. There you are, Don. So I am going to stop sharing and I am going to introduce our first speaker for this evening. Rosena Fung grew up and is based in Toronto, Canada. Her first graphic novel, Living with Viola, is published by Annick Press. Her illustration clients include The Globe and Mail, The Boston Globe, Chronic Review of Higher Education, CBC Arts, Plan Sponsor, Mass, Mass Nova, no, you can help me. <laughs> it's <Mesa News. laughs> Yes, yep. Bust Magazine, Chickadee <laughs> Magazine, Swerve Magazine, Tridel Corporation, and Toronto Transit Commission. When she's not drawing, Rosanna can be found teaching illustration, vending at zine fairs, we all know zines are the best, and going to the library. Um, her activities are reading, eating snacks, who doesn't love that, cats, and learning to play the guitar. Thank you so much for joining us, Rosanna. I'm freakishly excited. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I will do a, uh, a, uh, a screen share now um, just to show you. Yes. Okay. I think that's okay. I hope it's all good. Okay. Um, I just want to give everyone this like a little like behind the scene uh, about living with Viola. So um, this is me. Uh, so I am uh, based in Toronto. I grew up in Toronto as well. And so uh, I wrote and drew living with Viola. I'm also a cartoonist and illustrator. So this is just some of the work that I've done, just so you can see, like, I work for all the clients that uh, mentioned. Um, Maisonneuve is a French, uh, it's based in Montreal, which is like a French-speaking, English and French-speaking um, province, or sort of city in, uh, in a French <laughs> province in Canada. Um, so these are just a few other things that I've done as well. Um, and yeah, so Living with Viola is my first book. I'm very excited about it. It came out last year. I can't believe, oh no, two, oh my gosh, a year and a half ago. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't believe it's been so, it's a whirlwind. Um, and then, so just a little bit of background. So it's basically, uh, it follows the um, a story about Livy. She is about to start a new school, completely new school. She's very scared. Um, and she's about to start grade six. She doesn't know anyone. So the book follows her navigating um uh you know making new friends and like um you know like adapting to a new school while also balancing family expectations and family pressures as well um and then it's also Livy has a shadowy twin character who follows her out everywhere looks like her um and her name is Viola um and basically Viola amplifies all of her deepest like insecurities her doubts and um you know says all these mean negative things about her uh and to her and so so, uh, Livy, uh, sorry, Viola is a personification of Livy's anxiety. So this book is about uh, Livy learning how to live with Viola, how to manage her, uh, manage life with Viola, because she can't get like in general, we can't get rid of anxiety. You just can't like push it away. But it, she learns how to uh, live with Viola and therefore learning to live with her anxiety. So um, those are the lessons that she learns throughout while also making new friends and like, you know, learning about what she likes as well. So just a little, you know, where did it all start? Um, I was very lucky to have been approached by a incredible editor. Her name is Sarah Marie McMahon and she works for Annick Press and she said, you know, I like your work a lot. She saw me on Instagram. Would you like to make a book? And I was like, I would love to make a book. That would be amazing. Um, I love comics so much. I've always loved comics, reading. I love reading. Oh my God. I love books, everything. So it's like a dream. And so I started out with me doing these short little comics to try to flesh out these characters. She had told me like what 
think about what story is important to you. What is it that you want to talk about? And I had a bunch of ideas, but talking about anxiety was definitely, um, it was high. And obviously it was the one we went with. And it's because it's something that I went through. Like I literally, when I was in grade six, I started feeling a lot of things that I didn't understand. And it wasn't just puberty. It was, it was just like, um, I was scared all the time and I didn't know who to talk to. I did talk to my parents, um, which is a different thing because Libby takes some time before she does. Um, but I did. But when I was growing up, which would have been like the late 90s, early 2000s, the discourse for mental health was not as prominent as it is now. So I'm very happy that things have changed a lot. Um, but at the time, I was just scared and I thought it was abnormal. I didn't know what was happening. And my parents were super supportive, but they also were sort of at a loss as well. So it took me a while before I was diagnosed. It was not until I was about 16 until they were like, you have anxiety um, and panic disorder. And when I found out, it was actually kind of a huge relief because I was like, oh, I finally understand and it was also like I'm not by myself I didn't feel so alone um and so I wrote this book um I wanted to tell that story for one but because it's my own story and I I tend to plumb <laughs> the experiences of my life <laughs> to write stories and comic because it's easier okay <laughs> but also just because I know you know I don't want um a young or an older reader to wait before um you know looking for help like asking for help is something that I find difficult myself so I and I don't want someone to hold back thinking, you know, there's something wrong or, you know, because there's always someone who can help you whatever age you are at. So I want them to like, you know, find that sooner rather than later. And also like, I think um, I'm hoping that it's helpful to, you know, if a young reader may not be able to articulate something they're feeling, if they have anxiety, they can point to the book and say, this is how it feels, right? And hopefully it can help someone understand. Or conversely, if someone doesn't have any experience with anxiety, um, but they can get an idea oh like exactly like windows and mirrors right like someone can get an idea of like oh i understand now what so and so is saying when they say they feel a certain way so i'm just hoping it's like an anchor for everyone um and just to talk about it but also i'm hoping because it's entertaining <laughs> and like fun um so we started with these little comics and then um came up with the script it's kind of like writing a movie script uh and then it's a lot of drawing <laughs> it's like draw all the pages into rough and then I have to go into sketches and then I go into inking I do everything by hand that happens <laughs> that happens sometimes unfortunately anyways but I I color everything digitally so everything is like a digital format anyways for printing so it's okay so I do all these different color studies character studies and then um so any like these kind of mistakes are easily fixable once it's digital thank god um but yeah I do uh, character studies here are different like characters um like her friend um her teacher and her parents uh Libby's I mean um so just trying to figure out like who they are by drawing them a lot uh this is my studio I'm sitting here right now uh even <laughs> just looking at this photo is kind of dark I <laughs> just they talking about the lighting in my place needs more I need better lighting but anyway I love color and I love things and I love toys so as you can see there's lots of it happening here I like to surround myself with it um oh and then is my cat <laughs> she's it's actually about her almost her dinner time she's just kind of hovering around but anyway hopefully she won't bother <laughs> um i drink a lot of bubble tea i drank a lot me and my editor did a lot of it like while working on the book um and these are all of my favorite things and you know a lot of people ask like why is there so much food in the book like i was like because i love food I love it so much. I want to draw as much of it as possible. So that's why. Um, I'll, and some people have also asked, like, kids, they're very cute. They're like, are you Libby? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not Libby exactly, but I mean, a lot of your experiences are my own. And a lot of things that she likes are things that I like because I love drawing them. So she loves plushy. She loves reading. She loves Chinese food. She likes she like bubble tea. Um, anyway, so just to wrap it up. So I'm very happy and lucky. <laughs> uh, I feel very privileged to have been able to tell the story um, and that people also enjoy reading it. I really am really grateful that it is resonating um, with people. I didn't, you know, when I was younger, I thought very much like, oh, why would anyone want to read a book about me? <laughs> you know, um, what, what, I don't have anything important or anything interesting to say, but I, I think everyone has a story to tell. And I think it's always interesting to hear what they have to say. And I'm very grateful for many other people sharing their stories with me too. So um, I'm very excited and very honored to be able to like be part of bookmaking because I love books so much. <laughs> it's like honestly my favorite thing ever, um, besides drawing and 
cats and food. <laughs> but anyways, okay. Now I'm going to stop screen sharing. So I'll come up and then uh, I'd love to answer like any questions you may have. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Okay. So I'm back. Uh, yeah. So yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's so great. So I've got a copy. I straight stole this copy from one of the book discussion <laughs> sets that we have at the service center. For everyone here to know, we have three sets um, at the service center that can be booked up to a year in advance. I saw that someone in the chat said that they were hoping to um, use this book and hollow fires for their school's annual book fest. So don't be surprised if you hear from Connecticut Yay. a little more <laughs> often. Um, but so you said that someone came to you and was like, hi, write a book, please. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think about um, publishing your own like full novel while you mm -hmm. were doing all the other illustration work? Yeah, that's a, that is a great question. So I have always loved comics since I, I don't know, I was a child. I learned how to read from Archie Comics and I read so many. Um, and I've always wanted to write my own comic as well. Um, but I didn't, writing comics uh okay so it took three years to write this so uh mm -hmm. and like you know it's i think it's um it's not surprising that any book takes at least a year or longer to write um so it takes some time and i i was trying to make choices about my life in general and my career so I didn't actually, I went to um, art school later in life. So I went to, I graduated from high school. I went to uh, University of Toronto. I did my master's there and I just wasn't really happy. Um, but I didn't want to pursue art right away because I thought it wasn't stable. In fact, it is, <laughs> it is actually a point like in the book because like sure the is. is like, art is not a staple thing. Like that's literally <laughs> my life. My my parents have always been supportive, but like they have also like, especially my dad has always been like, be great if you were a doctor. <laughs> but anyways, um, and I'm like, oh, that's never gonna happen. <laughs> I get so squeamish with like blood or whatever. Um, but there is that, there was always that pressure. And I thought, okay, no, I shouldn't pursue art. It's not stable. It's not, it's not good, you know, whatever. And so, but it took some time and I finally did. I'm like, you know what? Nothing else is making me happy. I'm going to do this. So whatever, I'm old now. <laughs> I get to make my choices. <laughs> so I did. And I'm happy that I did. And I, I studied illustration and I was doing illustration work as well as working another like full-time job. Um, and even then I was still like, I really want to make a comic, but I knew that wouldn't have to mean sacrifice in terms of like time and where to put my efforts to and and I still have to make money like I have like you know I had a student loan I have like debt I have rent to pay and so sitting like taking the time off to write a book is was kind of a leap that I wasn't really quite prepared for immediately after art school so it took some time but I mean about like five years after I was like you know what? I've been doing illustration work I'm still working I really want to do this so I was just about to start like putting together my own book proposals and then when my editor came to me it was really um like what's the word uh fortuitous serendipitous serendipitous like it just happened when I decided like I'm gonna do a comic now I don't care anymore and then like a month later she's like hey would you like to do this comic and it just worked out that way I'm very lucky and she is so great I love her so much I'm working with her right now on another book I'm really mm -hmm. happy about yeah um but even if she hadn't approached me I probably would have gone ahead and like started pitching anyways because I think mm -hmm. I was at that stage I was ready you were ready. So, yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Listen, the universe does what the universe does. Yeah, yeah. The universe is ready for you. That's <laughs> I awesome. Guess. I know. Oh my gosh. So we actually just, uh, we have another question um, mm -hmm. from someone in the chat who said, I loved the book. In addition to calling attention to anxiety, mm -hmm. you developed a realistic character who also makes mistakes in her decisions about others. Her mm -hmm. interactions with her friends are genuine in their honesty. Was it difficult to create Viola's character considering how you had to develop her personality as well as her anxiety, which you personified, which I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. That was really good because, um, you know, with, with Livy, because I based so much of her life on my life, um, I remember having discussions with my editor being like, we, like, everyone isn't perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect person. And they will make choices that are not nice it's not that they're bad people we just sometimes make not the greatest choices not because we're intentionally trying to be malicious but just because 
we don't think about something else, right? And that was a storyline that we really were trying to work towards that was that I think ended up being pretty good where she unintentionally sort of like slights Charlotte, like one of her friends, without really thinking about it. She's just like, oh, but I, I want to do this instead. And like, but it, it's it's kind of upsetting. And like, it's, we do make mistakes and I think it's important to be accountable to that as well um, for our choices, whatever they might be, right? Um, whether our intentions are good or not, or just not even thinking about it. So working on her personal um was it was interesting um I uh I don't know like I I think like I think when I approach all characters now I just think about them as like um I have to make sure they're as nuanced as possible like everyone will make choices um and sometimes they will make not great choices um in depending on the situation um but like there's no i try to um and me and my editor were trying to work away from like one-dimensional characters like this person is outgoing and that's all that they are right so even if someone it only shows up for like I don't know, like a page or whatever. I already in my head, I'm like, well, this is what their whole thing is like, right? And then I feel like it's important to treat all human beings like that in general, but uh, like all characters. So working with like, so that was um, me and my editor developing Vivi. And then in terms of like Viola, when I was developing her, I just, for her, it was kind of clear though, I think when I was writing her, I'm like, she's just mean. <laughs> she is just like mean and she says nasty thing. Um, and it's not too difficult either because Viola is... Um, anxiety personified and I have anxiety and I still do because as I said we can't get rid of it um, but uh, I don't actually envision there's not actually like I don't see myself <laughs> like a separate person I just I wanted to make it easier for like young readers to understand how it can be very um, so powerful right by drawing it as a person but like that those things that she says are very like much like my own the things that I say in my own head right like the things that are very negative and so writing her was uh, it was I wouldn't say it's easy because like I had to go into like some deep dark places but like at the same time I could capture that voice really well because I'm so used to it mm -hmm. uh, you did a good job no it was as someone I also have anxiety and I was telling Ashley um when I finished the book I was like the these pages are yeah. stressful like and but in a in an appropriate way like you mm -hmm. found a balance and you found a balance between the like the art and the illustration right so there mm -hmm. i i read and read a lot of graphic novels a lot of like mm -hmm. web comics i was looking at one of the pictures and i was like oh laura olympus love that book oh, <laughs> like so um started reading that when it was on webtoon yeah so <laughs> what was it like for you? I, I know you showed some pictures hmm. because it wasn't just like the words of Viola that were angry. It was just like the way that, that they were put together. Like they mm -hmm. would be big and sometimes they'd be turned into a ball and thrown at her. Right. And, and then I noticed that the back panels would turn into like this blue and like these darker colors, which was, um, which really stood out, especially when sort of like the heroes, like when um, the things that Libby loved were trying mm -hmm. to kind of help her. What what was that process like? Did you have to do some of that at the same time? Because it was really impactful. And like, you hit the nail on the head, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a fully mm -hmm. grown adult, but you definitely, I think you hit the <laughs> nail on the head. Well, thank you. That I'm very, very happy to hear that. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm, I'm very lucky because uh, I, um, I'm also an illustrator, and like illustrators, uh, and I've been like, I went to art school to study it. Uh, we, we work a lot with metaphors, like visual metaphors. Like we're always trying to think about like communicating um, an idea, a story, using like visual metaphors. And so I, I apply those like to this story. I thought like this one thing to describe what anxiety is like, but what does it feel like? Like what does it look like visually? so it can feel like drowning um or like like flailing in water or it can feel like a huge boulder is running at you or, or you know coming at you and so um while I was writing the script I already had the visuals kind of in my head like I had all these mm -hmm. ideas of, like because sometimes like before I wrote this book whenever I tried to like describe like what is anxiety like it makes more sense to use analogies right so that mm -hmm. someone can get a better idea so like that's how I in like it was already like in the process of writing I, I would have these descriptions like Viola it, or sorry Libby is like drowning and like um there's also and she's flailing and so on so I already knew what that would look like um and so um I I'm lucky in that regard in that like I it, it coincides with like my illustration work I guess um to better like try to um 
get someone like a reader to understand what a, a sensation the sensation and the feeling i guess the emotional like feeling of anxiety not just the things that are being said but like literally how can it feel like in terms of the, your senses um mm -hmm. so yes it's always like something in the back of my mind yeah yeah and so you i mean you you we i we read through all of the illustrations that you did mm -hmm. um before before beginning this graphic novel are are, were those types of illustrations, and I think you've done murals as well, mm. is sort of the way you approach that type of art different from the way that you approached living with Fiola? Mm -hmm. uh, it really depends on uh, what the what uh, the client is, I guess, asking for. Sometimes, um, depending on what they may want, if it's a mural, sometimes they're like, we want you to encapsulate like a, a feeling, right? So whether it's a mural, can you encapsulate the feeling of this neighborhood? So I would like research like different landmarks or like activities that happen there. Um, but then there are some, I've done like stories, like illustrate a story. And when I do that, that is actually closer, I would say to like, living with viola where you're doing storytelling visually um the mural sometimes can be yeah it's just a different approach i think for different different clients and different needs so yeah definitely murals are i definitely find like capture the a feeling of like and it's usually like a happy feeling <laughs> um but some of them are like yeah articles for newspapers magazines and they're like try to encapsulate this story um without just you know literally drawing what's there but like to create something new new symbols and um like revi revised new tropes and so on and so that was definitely closer to living with viola mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pro yeah probably for like the pages because there were a couple of pages where there were no words at all mm -hmm. we're just kind of looking at the art of yeah. of like livy or viola just sort of like so just like just going through it poor thing she just went yeah. through it so that's <laughs> that's like that's how i felt the entire book i'm like this poor girl is just <laughs> Stressed, yes. stressed to the max. <laughs> yes. But she had some really great. She had like her. She had some things that made her really happy, like mm -hmm. um, reading. And when she went to the library, my librarian heart. Yes, <laughs> I was really excited yeah. about that. Library saving, save the day. Um, yeah, and <laughs> she drew. She said she loved um, like sparkly plushies and things. Mm -hmm. And I saw a plushie in one of your pictures that yeah. you were showing. So <laughs> did the happy things that, you know, sort of that Viola would try to use or that Livy would try to use to combat Viola, were those, are those some of the happy things in your life also? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, every uh, every person who has anxiety um, will have a different coping mechanism, you know. Um, I'm hoping just to show them, like, this is, this works, this worked for Livy, also known as me, <laughs> uh, this worked for us, but um, I'm hoping that readers who do experience anxiety will find something that works for them. But for me, definitely, it was definitely, like, trying to uh, surround myself with, like, like incessant optimism and like brightness and like happiness so whatever it is that made me happy um that brought joy like I just had to keep doing it because it was something to offset that like persistent negativity um of what anxiety is right which is just you know fatalistic and I'm just like no there are good things in life that are joyful and I have to remind myself like that's what they are and so yeah I love plushies I love drawing library going to the library is like my safe like haven <laughs> wherever I I love the library so much like whenever Whenever I travel and go to different cities and countries, I'm like, the bookstore in the library is just like, just like I feel at home, even if I can't understand the language. Yeah. <laughs> I went to I Tokyo and I was like, oh man, this library is so soothing. <laughs> I can't read anything, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> like they're saying, oh, I love that. Over. It's so oh. nice. Yeah. Yay, so I love you hear books that so much. <laughs> Yeah, I just find it so, like, very calming. But anyways, yeah, so those are all things that help me very much. And I'm hoping that, you know, readers will find whatever works for them um, to surround themselves with it, too. And there's also, like, Livy is, you know, there's a lot of, like, gendered expectations as well. Like, oh, if you like plushies and pink things, that means you're girly. And I'm like, there's no such thing as girly. Like, anyone can like a plushie. Um, anyone can like pink. Pink is not, there's no gender mm -hmm. color. Mm -hmm. And so, like, there's also, like, the part of, like, Livy, you like what you like girl read what you want don't yeah. like don't make someone feel like it's not good enough because it's girly right it's the same thing with me and also like I'm, I'm older adult and sometimes like my mom's like you have so many toys and I'm like I'm gonna keep buying toys <laughs> and I'm I don't gonna care. buy another one I what's know. that TikTok I think there's like a TikTok that says like I'm just a kid with adult money now and yes I think that... <laughs> it's so true oh, I buy so many toys and plushies 
gosh. You buy toys. I buy yarn. Oh, you know, I, you yeah. <laughs> so good. Yeah. So I've got a question. This is a question for me. I don't okay, know how yeah. many people have read this book. So one of the things that we do on the All CT Reads website is for each mm-hmm. book, we, we scour the internet and we put together a bunch of support materials. So we'll hunt mm-hmm. for discussion questions, podcasts, you know, just sort of whatever. I found a dumpling recipe. What's oh, the yeah. story? It's so, <laughs> is this your recipe? Did your team do this? I want to no. make this. If I make it, will it be okay? I love dumplings. <laughs> You okay? So there's a scene in the book. Um, one of Libby's coping mechanisms is to like cook with her mom and to make dumpling. Uh, that's literally because my mom taught me how to make dumplings when I was young. Uh, it's really, it's actually really easy. Um, although the story with that recipe is kind of funny. Okay, so when I was like, I don't know, eleven or twelve, she's like, okay, let's make dumplings. And dumplings, making dumplings is actually generally very communal. Like it's, it's a lot of fun. You can do it with like yourself uh but you can do it with lots of people it's like i find a lot of families do it together i think it's like a, and friends groups of friends do it together it's just like a fun thing that you can do and it's nourishing so it's good so when i was young she taught me how it's pretty easy you can follow the recipe but like you can buy like a package of like uh either one ton or dumpling wrappers at like the grocery store um and then like you make your own meat mixture so the recipe is that meat mixture and then I so I couldn't remember exactly what the recipe was it's been a long time since I've had like I've made them because like I'm very lazy so I usually buy frozen dumplings now but this so I, I remember texting my mom and being like hey I need to use this for like I, I need your recipe and my mom's recipes are terrible she's like okay you need meat green onion and salt and pepper and then I was oh. like what kind of meat <laughs> Like, pour until I say stop. My mom does that. She goes, add a little bit of, I'm like, how much, mom? Oh, gosh. I had to grill her, and then we had to, like, figure something out together. And I was like, what what kind of meat? How much? What else am I supposed to put in there? Oh, my gosh, she kills me. But it's not just that. It's like, anytime I'm like, hey, mom, I want to make this recipe. She's like, what do you do? And she gives me the barest, like, just, like, mix this together. Pour that. Done. (laughs) Oh gosh. But anyway, so the rest of you should be good now. You can do that. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. very tasty. And then the thing is like, you know, you can't really mess it up. It's gonna be tasty no matter what. Um, but yeah, definitely like I recommend doing it with friends, with family. It's just like a nice, like fun thing to do. That's so great. So yeah. for libraries who have kitchens available or something like that, mm-hmm. I mean, that sounds like a fun program, even if so much of librarians to get, I because I was scouring, I found a coloring sheet, which I thought was cute. Yes. And, I was like, and I hadn't read the book yet. So I'm like, oh, whole dumpling recipe? And I'm just yeah. like, this has to be in the book somewhere. I don't yeah. know what's going on. <laughs> but I see what you say about the communal part, because, you know, yeah. we do see that at the end also, mm-hmm. you know, sort of like um, Olivia's community coming together to do something, you know, sort mm-hmm. of at the end of the book. So that's really lovely. Yeah. Well, so I think my, my last question, um, who, who, what, so I, I, I just, I like, I don't know, like I assume we're both in the millennial age range and at the time there weren't so many graphic novels, there were comics, Mm -hmm. there were comic strips, but they're not sort of the way that, that you have them and sort of other, um, authors and illustrators. So who were some of your favorite illustrators growing up mm, that sort of yes. helped get you here? Yes, yes, good question. Um, yeah, when I was young, or when we were young, yeah, there was not a lot. Um, I read a lot of uh, Archie comics, as they said. Comic strips were definitely what I learned how to um, write a comic, like how to do that, like, um, you know, building rising action and then like the punchline within like four panels. So like I've read so many of those. I still kind of write like that in a way, like the setup to and then the punchline um so I've read a lot of like Calvin and Hobbes Garfield for better for worse was definitely one of my favorites um but as many as I could read and then I would occasionally read like some superhero comic I mean that's what it was right it was either the comic strip or if it was like Marvel and DC which are also really great um and I I like reading some of them now but when I was younger it wasn't like especially when I was like 10 or even younger like 8 9 10 11 it wasn't always because a lot of them are geared towards um like more like teen or adult and I wasn't always comfortable with that, especially as like a young girl growing up, going through puberty mm-hmm. and like being and like, you know, not always the greatest representation of women. And so like yes. I didn't find myself. So that was hard. <laughs> so that's why like I, I was more towards comic strips and Archie's comic. for sure. Yeah, yeah, because they were a little bit more like 
um, comfortable at least. And so, you know, later in high school, I would be reading manga. But again, like when we were growing up, manga was not as popular as it is now. It was so expensive because like mm -hmm. the, for the translations, if I wanted to buy one, and you know, manga usually is like volumes of like 20. <laughs> that one's going to tell you nothing. It's yeah, like, here are exactly. all the characters, yeah. the yeah. end. Yeah. Like, it's <laughs> not, I know. And then like, it would cost like $25 for one or more or 30 because of the, it was at the time more expensive import. And yeah. so like, I couldn't read as much them um but anyways but now like i'm he i love i read so many graphic novels so like reina telgemeier with her smile and like guts and all of her books like really mm -hmm. revolutionized Sisters. like middle grade graphic novels i'm like indebted to her like legacy for just for doing that but i love i like i love so many comics now like um oh my god i can't even i can't even start like i have I know, like a whole pile that's the that's the what's your favorite book question oh, that just like ribbons like slides. I'm just so happy Yay! I have so many of them right now. Oh my god, I love be prepared. <laughs> oh, you oh, can't really see it, but like be, so yeah. And nice then what lady. else? I just read like Allergic. That was really Allergic. Good. I've read that so oh, so good. Saw Magic just came out so good. Noted. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, so so many graphic novels now. I feel like I'm like so rich like to be in a world that has so many incredible graphic novels and that was the thing too like the book that I wrote is kind of like the book that I wish I could have read when I was younger I definitely didn't see a lot of comics for young girls and especially not young Asian girls like at all I never saw myself and so like I definitely wanted to write something for a younger me I love that. And the rest of us, thank you. Because I'll tell you, it couldn't be me. Can't do it. I can read it. I can gush over it. That's but I am friend. indebted to librarians and libraries, like, so much. My entire life. Not just because of this book, but just because, like, oh, my God. I can't imagine a life without libraries. I really cannot. My whole life is, my child is, like, I love libraries so much. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And yes. we love you, too. If you're ever in Connecticut and you want to see some libraries, there's more libraries in towns, so it won't be hard to find one. Okay. Um, that is good to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much thank Rosanna, you. for your time and for your book. Everyone living with Biola, we've got three 12 book sets at the service center that can be booked for 365 days in advance. Um, and, you know, Rosanna, don't be shocked if you start getting some emails from, you know, yeah, young kids or librarians so. in Connecticut. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye. I'll mute myself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Feel free to hang around if you want to. Awesome. Oh, guys, that was so great. So next, I'm going to bring up to the screen my friend. Everyone's my friend. We're not going to go through this again this year. Alessandra Cassiello, who was on the Teen Book Selection Committee, um, who is going to be introducing our next speaker who is here with us, Samira Ahmed. I'm so excited. I get to gush now uh, off screen. So Alessandra, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Yes, and I get to gush on screen now. I am so excited to introduce our next author and to have them speak about this specific book, but also about all of the books that they've done because I've read them all and they are incredible and amazing. Um, Samira Ahmed is the best-selling author of Love, Hate, and Other Filters, Internment, Mad, Bad, and Dangerous to Know, Hollow Fires, and the Amira and Hamza middle grade duology, as well as a Miss Marvel comic book miniseries. Her poetry, essays, and short stories have appeared in numerous publications and anthologies, including the New York Times, Take the Mic, Color Outside the Lines, Vampires Never Get Old, and A Universe of Wishes. She was born in Bombay, India, and grew up, grew up in Batavia, Illinois, in a house that smelled like fried onions, spices, and potpourri. A graduate of the University of Chicago, Samira has taught high school English in both the suburbs of Chicago and New York City, worked in education nonprofits, and spent time on the road for political campaigns. When she's not reading or writing, she can be found on her lifelong quest for the perfect pastry, which I also think everybody <laughs> here appreciates and understands. So with that, I am um, so happy to say welcome to Samira Ahmed. And I'll hand it over to you. Hi, Alessandra. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. I just want to start off by saying um, I'm just so honored that Hollow Fires is the teen selection for all CT reads. That's truly amazing because there's so many great YA books out right now. And um, I just want to say thank you. Um, and, you know, I, there's already been a little bit of talk about this 
on here before, but libraries have meant so much to me. Um, growing up as a kid in my small town of Batavia, Illinois, we were the first Indian family to live in the town. Um, and, you know, we were new immigrants. We were one of the only immigrant families. And the library was um, more than just like a safe space, just a place where I could go hang out. I loved, I did the summer reading club every year. <laughs> um, and it was just very, very important to me. In fact, the one of the very first pieces that I ever had published was about my relationship to libraries in a collection of, of essays and anthology called This is What a Librarian Looks Like. Um, and so um, libraries mean so much to me. And when I was an undergrad, I was work study and I worked in the library. I worked in special collections. Um, so I was a page, but I also got to work in a book preservation lab. So I am a library geek, like in my bones. Uh, so this really just, I, I'm very honored. This selection means so much to me. So thanks. I'm going to, what I thought I would do is read a little bit of Hollow Fires, talk a little bit about sort of some of the things that run through my books and maybe some of my, the inspiration behind Hollow Fires. Um, and I want to make sure we have um, time for questions. So just jump in. What time should we do for questions? Absolutely. Um, I guess we could stop around 5.53-ish. Yes, perfect. Um, perfect. And um, take some questions then. Okay, that sounds good. So I'm going to first just start ta by talking a little bit about um, my sort of writer experience. Now, one thing I, I always say when I, one thing I always talk about when I go, especially to schools is, you know, I ask everyone this question, like, who was asked as a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? Every single person on earth has been asked this. And when I was a kid, my answers were um, ballerina, tennis player, and doctor. So uh, I did not become any of those things. <laughs> but I, all of those things were sort of like uh, part of the bedrock of what, uh, you know, eventually led me into my writing life. Um, and I, I am thankful that I have many, many experiences that led me to here. I, I spent a long time as a high school English teacher, and I worked in education reform. I helped build new high schools. I was a lobbyist for education funding. Um, but so much of my education experience centered around teens and, and, and high schools. And I, I absolutely love that age so much. I think um, teens, especially the readers that I'm writing for right now, Gen Z, are truly incredible. They're inspiring. And I always say, you know, I know there is that the phrase of like, you know, they're the future, but I always think like that's actually not accurate because these young people are also our today. And so I kind of write to honor their stories. And, you know, that is, is just really, that's just really important to me. Um, so young people are my inspiration. My former students are my inspiration. And um, all these young people that I meet, uh, um, you know, whether it's in school visits or even just like my neighborhood, like when I'm going to my local bookstore, um, these are the people whose stories inspire me. Their courage inspires me. And I always call this age uh, that I'm writing in, like that young adult age, the realm of possibility, because you're really on that cusp between, um, you know, childhood and adulthood. And I always think of it as, I, I mean, just visually, I imagine it as kind of this space where there's all these doors. and you know, young people are looking at all these doors and they're invited to open them, to, to journey down one of them. And some of those doors are going to be blocked. Some of them, you know, are going to be really hard to open. Sometimes kids are going to be opening a door and they look down that path and they're like, oh, I really don't want to go down that path. But um, so I feel like this is just such an interesting space to write for. Um, it's a natural, it's a space of natural conflict also, especially with parents. Um, and the adult figures in your life, because, you know, ultimately the job of a parent is to, you know, give their child everything they need to be fully independent. And teen, you know, the age of teenagers is that time where they're like, okay, now I have my independence and I'm moving away. And that's usually when like parents and the adults around them are like, no, we're trying to hold you back a little bit because we don't want you to, you know, 
get away yet. And so I think that causes an interesting natural friction. And so, so much of all of that space, that realm is what I write my stories into. It's a, it's a space where young people are finding their voices and they're finding their politics. And so often, and in, in, in virtually all of my books, um, I write about times in, in childhood, uh, you know, where, where part of childhood is shattered um, because of decisions that adults have made, um, because of societal, um, you know, because of societal forces that young people um, not only can't control, but because they are young, have not really been able to yet um, influence. And I feel so often, and it's so unfair that um, our kids are forced to find their courage because of these decisions that adults are making. You know, I, I often say that it's old men who decide to that we have to go to war and it's young people that have to end up fighting those wars. And sometimes that's just a, you know, it's a metaphorical war. Sometimes it's very much a, a reality. So that's what a lot of my writing is about. And I, I like to say that the through line that runs through all of my books are, is that I like to write stories of the revolutionary girl. Young women who are, you know, like I said, finding their voices. Sometimes revolution can be loud. Sometimes it can be, you know, marching in the streets, like what I see Gen Z for Change doing right now, what I saw the kids from Parkland doing, what I see little Miss Flint, who's been doing for literally years to try to get clean water, um, it, you know, in Detroit, what I, in Flint rather. And, and even like kids in my neighborhood who inspire me, like during the start of, of COVID and the pandemic, um, you know, we, there was a huge mask shortage, especially in, you know, our nursing homes. And that's some of our most vulnerable um, you know, fellow citizens and a young person in my neighborhood, uh, he, he was in middle school, decided that he was going to try to sew masks for the nursing homes. And he asked his mom to teach him how to sew. And he learned how to sew masks on the sewing machine. And then he got his friends involved. And these young people, you know, they're seventh and eighth graders, made all these masks for um, a local nursing home. Now, is that a giant revolution? No. But is it an incredible revolutionary act that these young people did? Yes. And could it have made a difference in the lives of someone? Absolutely. So that's what I try to capture in my stories. Um, the brilliance of, of, of teens. And, um, you know, I hope that when adults come to my stories and read them, because YA is for everyone. My protagonists, of course, and young adult protagonists are teens. But, um, you know, I, I so often get older people who say to me, like, I read young adult too. And I'm like, it's okay. You don't have to whisper it like you're taking drugs. Um, and, but what I hope that adults um, get from my novels, if they're reading them, is just it's sort of a, almost a remembrance of what it means to be young and like the power that young people have if we open up a little space for them in our world. As adults, I think that's a huge part of our responsibility. Um, I feel like an ethical obligation to young people as an adult. Um, and I wanna give them that space to shine. So I think that's, I guess, a lot of why I write. So for Hollow Fires, I was inspired um, by a few different things. One is, um, true crime. Like I know true crime podcasts are hugely popular. I also, um, love true crime podcasts, but in, in listening to some true crime, I was, I, I mean, I, I guess it was raising a lot of these sort of ethical questions for me, like whose stories are told? Um, who, um, what is the point of view from which those stories are being told? Why is it that we as a culture know the names of so many serial killers, but we don't know the names or the stories of the lives of their victims. Because all of those people were people who were loved and who had dreams and, you know, whose lives were cut short by hatred. Um, and when I was listening to a lot of true crime podcasts, I mean, there's some podcasts that do a great job of that, but I, I also felt like I'm not getting enough of the story um, from the point of view of, of the families who, who have lost so much and, um, I also found that we don't hear the stories often of people of color who are 
who are victims. You know, for example, there has been a rash of disappearances of indigenous women, and we just don't hear about them throughout, like in North America, uh, US and Canada. There is also a, 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 an incredible number of black trans women who have been murdered, and we don't really ever hear their stories. Um, and we also know just statistically that crimes committed against white people are more likely to be solved than crimes committed against black and brown and indigenous people. Um, so those are things that I wanted to investigate. I also know that as a teacher, I remember talking to my students about the notions of truth, right? Because especially now we are bombarded by media. And during the Trump administration, when we had this term alternative facts come to the fore, I was like, what is that? What are we even telling our, our young people? And so I just wanted to arm young people with the understanding that when they look at media, when they're absorbing media, they have to be asking those critical questions. Like, what are the sources of this information? What are What is truth and fact and what is alternative fact? And when does it serve people to lie or obfuscate fact? Um, and so those were all things that kind of went into the story. And Hollow Fires is a story of um, a young woman who is trying to solve a crime. At first, a, a young, uh, young boy, a Muslim um, Iraqi American whose family were refugees, goes missing. And no one seems that interested in what's happened to this boy, except Sophia, the uh, you know the protagonist of the story, who knows that this was a young person who deserves so much more than he's getting what what's happened to him and then when he turns out to be murdered again it's a little bit of a flash on the pan like in media we get a little bit of story about it and then he's just easily forgotten and Sophia wants to find justice for him she doesn't want to allow she doesn't want him to be forgotten um because he you know, like I said before, he was a young person who lived and who had dreams and passions and was loved and um, he deserves to be remembered. And she, she wants to seek justice for him, even as she's questioning what it means, um, what justice means for somebody who has been murdered in his family. So um, this novel is a dual POV. I remember how I said I, I felt like I want to hear more of the story of the victim. So in my novel, because I can do it in fiction, I actually give Jawa, the young boy who was murdered, um, a, point of a point of view. So um, we have a dual POV, Sophia, the young high school, um, you know, she's the editor of her school newspaper, uh, a young Muslim American girl who wants to find justice. We have Jawa's voice, which is um, essentially compelling Sophia to, to, to find him. And um, then there's also found documents. So one of the things that I was talking about, like when I, we're trying to understand truth and fact, and I was saying we're always bump, we're bombarded with so much media now, I wanted to sort of have the reader experience a little bit of what the characters would experience, how they're getting all this information about who's going missing and who was murdered. And it's also, all those found documents are, all, you know, there, there are Reddit posts, there's tweets, there's um, blog posts from very right-wing uh, media, there's transcripts from, the news, there, there's podcast interviews. And I just wanted the reader to be able to sort of have the experience that the way the characters are, are having it. So this was um, a book that was like very near and dear to, to my heart. And it was also a little bit inspired by a crime that happened in 1924, the Leopold and Loeb murder. Um, so, which is something that I had studied in school and which to me really resonated uh, because there's so many questions and issues that arose in that trial and that crime that was nearly 100 years old that are still relevant to society today. I, I mean, we're already past the question point, so I'm sorry. Um, should I just read like two paragraphs really quick? Or do you want me to jump to, I'll, I'll just read, I'll, I'll read that. That's fine. So this yeah. is just from Sophia's point of view. It's just the very beginning of the novel. Um, because a novel begins sort of now and travels back into the past. Sophia, you never forget the first time you see a dead body. It was warmish for Chicago winter, and for the temperature hovering around freezing is warm. In Chicago, it is. 
There was the sickly sweet rotting smell of leaves that had fallen from trees, mixing with mud, never totally drying up before the first snow. The odor filled the air around the sloping embankments of a crumbling stone culvert that was lined with steel. The pipe was hidden by overgrown limp grass deep in Jackson Park and the part where no one goes because there are stories of ghosts and Mothman sightings. It's not the restored part of the park, the blooming Japanese garden, the shiny metal sculpture of giant petals, the bike paths and the Illinois prairie popping with blue corn flowers. It's the neglected area by the abandoned arched bridges that leads to nowhere. No one ever went there because there was absolutely nothing to see until the time there was. The first thing I saw was a shoe. And I think we can get to questions now. I saw somebody say something about the audiobook. Yes, the audiobook is fantastic. I really love my um my my voice actors for this. Uh there's there's two different ones and they're just amazing. Sunil and Ankani and Amin Al Gamini. So just uh, they're wonderful. Thank you so much, Samira. Before we get to questions, I am going to um, speak on the behalf of the people that are here today with us and those that will be watching us that have worked with uh, teens and young adults. I think your phrasing of that age being the realm of possibility is just absolutely heartwarming and amazing. And you put it into uh, words what I think any teen librarian has tried to explain to those that don't work with teenagers that like that is a different age group than children and it is a different age group than adults it is its own thing and it is the realm of possibility so I want to thank you for that <laughs> um moving on to the questions uh starting with hollow fires um you touched on this while you were speaking about the book but it really is told in three different perspectives, you know, um, and I'm just wondering how, how did you write that? You know, because you have <laughs> the main, the main story is right. Satya, right. That's, that's the main story. And then you have Jawad who is speaking as a ghost uh, of sorts. And then, the little snippets from the news. So mm -hmm. when you were writing, did you write it chronologically of, of how it's happening? Or did you mm -hmm. piece it together and put in those news snippets and Jawad's, um, you know, his time in the novel afterwards? Or, you know, how did you piece it together? Yeah. Because this one, it was a piece, it, to, so piece well. it together. Thank you so much. Because piecing <laughs> it together was, is exactly the right way because it was like a puzzle. So I am a very linear writer. Like I write from A to Z. I mean, I know there's many, every writer has a different style, but for me, I have to go from the front to the, to the end. So um, I was writing like all those. So I'll write like the Sophia chapter, then I'll write the Jawa chapter, and then I'd write, you know, if I thought that was where we, I needed to insert a found document or, you know, whatever the case may be. So I wrote it very linearly, but then um, during the revision process, I had to then like, okay, this needs to get cut. This needs to get moved over here. So I literally printed out the whole book. It was sort of a waste of paper. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but then it was, I had it on my attic floor, you know, 400 pages or whatever it was. And I was literally, some of the pieces I was having to move because, and I would literally take a piece of paper like, oh, okay, this, this Reddit post should actually go over here. And I had to just be mindful of like what, because the, the chapters have to speak to each other. But we don't want like a spoiler, you know, and they also have to be the time, the chronology has to be right because there is a little bit of a mishmash of chronology too. That, that is occurring. And, you know, we see parts where time is, seems to be sped up and then where it's slowed down. Uh, so yeah, it was basically like a giant puzzle, literally just on my floor. And, you know, the hard thing about that is when you cut something, when you decide, okay, I don't want this chapter, then you have to figure out how cutting one person's point of view or one of those found document pieces is gonna affect everything before and after. And then you have to revise accordingly. So it, it, was, a, it, it was a little bit of a challenge. Well, I, like I said, it it flows really well, even with the the different times. You know, it starts 
in present day, basically, right. and it goes backwards, and then it hops back to present day. But it it flows extremely well. Thank um, you. And you you did say this a little bit about how a lot of your your books are a girl revolution, mm-hmm. and um, I've noticed that because I've I've read all of all of your novels and your comics uh, as well, but. Um, how important is it for you to have that narration coming from a female protagonist, but not just a female protagonist? Because in every book, they're strong in different ways, your female protagonist. Uh-huh. It's not that, um, you know, in Hollow Fires, she's strong because she, you know, has some some things happening with her personally, obviously, Uh Um, you know, with her family, but Uh she's also taking on the task of solving this, this crime that nobody else seems to care about. Right. Um, You know, so how important is it? And how do you figure out what ways to make your female protagonist strong? Uh So, um, you know, I think that, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I can't predict the future, but I'm guessing that all my protagonists will always be these sort of revolutionary girl characters, but it doesn't necessarily mean to me that they're only strong because they all have vulnerabilities too. I mean, that's part of just being human and I want my characters to be as three-dimensional as possible. Um, so I also think though that having vulnerabilities or at admitting when you're wrong or when you need help um, is actually part of strength, like understanding the times where you need to lean on friends. And that's something that my characters sort of learn, like, hey, I don't have to be sort of the lone wolf in this situation. And maybe I don't know everything. And maybe I need to help find, you know, maybe I need some help in, in certain areas. And that's why I always try to have like a friend group. And in all my books, or in most of my books, the parents are present. They have some kind of role. Um, I know a lot of YA books, like there's missing parents. Um, but for me, especially like, look, I'm an immigrant, I'm, you know, I'm Indian American Muslim. And, you know, my characters, many of them have similar sort of identities. Um, and parents play a role in that immigrant life. So I wanted to have all those pieces, because I feel like having that community is part of where my characters draw their strength. Um, and also, you know, I talked about how I feel like young people at this age are just finding their politics and finding, you know, the truth of their voice. And I feel like that is really important for me to show. Like, I want my characters, I've met so many young people who are like this, like who have a strong sense of, you know, of what is right, of justice, who have important, you know, who want to push back against things that they see that are immoral or unethical that are happening in the world around them or asking questions about it. Like, even questions like, well, how, you know, because Sophia, for example, goes to a, you know, a pretty fancy private school, but she's a scholarship student. Mm-hmm. So she, um, you know, she can ask questions about privilege and then challenge, you know, people around her about that. Like, is it fair or equitable that some kids get to have this incredible um, education and all these great resources while others have nothing comparatively? Um, you know, um, even like the, the services that we have in our communities, like some communities are able to have to fund incredible libraries, for example. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, I, I talked about how much I love libraries because I think libraries are part of like our, our, our lighthouses in our democracy. And yet there's other communities that aren't able to have libraries funded via, you know, their, their town's budget or, um, because maybe their property values aren't the same or, or, or what have you. So I love that my characters will ask questions like that. Cause I think young people, even at a much younger age than what I'm writing for, like I'm talking third graders, fourth graders, they understand when they have a sense of fairness. They understand when they see injustices, even if they don't have the full vocabulary for that. So for me, it's always important to write characters like that because I think, um, that's real, you know? I mean, yes, they also are like, who am I going to go to prom with? Or, you know, like, I have a crush on this person, or I don't, you know, there's all these things that are vying for their attention, but that's just part of teenage life, you know? There's a lot of things going on. So, um, yeah, I think my characters can be strong and vulnerable at the same time. I think they can be thinking about, you know, their 
tennis match while at the same time they're thinking about, you know, the environment or um, a, a murder or justice or, or what have you, because I, I think that teams, you know, they contain multitudes. Yeah, they're not, they're not one dimensional. They're more right. than that. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, and our last question, actually, you, you just touched on this a little bit, but um, somebody who is here with us today said that uh, class distinction was so apparent in this novel and the fact that the school was private and that Safia was on a full scholarship speaks to a lot of adolescents. I wondered about the principal of the school. I get that he has to cater to the wealthy alumni, but wouldn't he want to be more understanding of Safia? He just seemed to be clueless and insensitive. I was so happy that Jawad at least had a teacher who understood and respected him, even though she couldn't save him. And I do like that she put in this distinction that Jawad did have um, an adult who, who was looking out for him and something bad still happened to him. Yeah, I mean, that's just reality because that can happen. So yeah. yes, the principal, um, I think he's actually more than clueless and, and sensitive. Like I, to me, he's part of the villain <laughs> um, or one of the villains of the story. And I wrote him that way because of just, um, because of real life examples of adult leadership that has done that. Um, this isn't a spoiler, but Jawad's story is um, um, partially based on uh, the story of what happened to this young man, um, Ahmed Mohammed, who built a clock or who like just, you know, who sort of tinkered with a clock, brought it to school and then was, was handcuffed and taken out of school um, because his, the adults of the school thought it was a bomb. Um, and he was perp out of the school, which to me was just absolutely incredible. He was found to have done no wrongdoing, yet the school still suspended him. Um, he brought in this thing that he was excited about. Hey, I'm doing this STEM project. I'm excited about it. I want to show it to my teachers. And then he gets arrested. And the school still suspended, continued his suspension even after he was cleared of any wrongdoing. That to me was an example of adults because that happened at the administrative level of adults uh, making really terrible, terrible choices. Um, you know, there was just, this just happened. Um, I was reading, oh gosh, now I can't remember. I can't remember the, the state or the district where this happened, but um, a, a teacher was reading to very young people sneetches and um, there was an NPR story about, um, about economics, actually, and how you teach economics to very young people. Uh, you know, like these are kindergarten first graders, I believe. And the, an admin who was in the room after one of the kids talked about how, hmm, the Sneech thing with the bellies and the stars, it seems kind of, it's unfair what's happening. And one child said, it's sort of like what happened to black people, it's like what was happening in society. So this was an observation a child made and that administrator who was in the classroom stopped the teacher from continuing to read that book. I mean that, so to me, I felt like this principle is based on so many real life examples of administrators um, who should be standing up more for their students and teachers and freedom to read and all of these things, but, but aren't. And so um, I also did want to have a positive example of teachers who can do great things. And, and Jawad's teacher, I mean, she tries so hard and she also knows that the system is sort of, um, you know, set up against her and also against him, but um, she does speak out and she even talks about some of her regrets and not being able to do more. But um, I wanted to have that example of, of, great teachers because there are, are there are great teachers you know um and we even have an example you, know, you put, in, put in a perfect balance in there to show and like you said you you had the representation of the parents that were involved in this story um you know and putting in those those adults that were aware of what was happening versus those adults who just don't want to see it they don't want to be part of it they don't want to say it exists um but I, I want to thank you for this novel, for all of your novels. Um, like I said, I am a huge fan of your work, and I think that the things that you're bringing to light in your novels is so important for young people, but for adults as well. Um, so I want to thank you, Samira. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Really, this really, uh, thank you to all the librarians. This really means so much to me. So thanks so much, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you, Samira. Thank you, Alessandra. This was so great. I listened to the audio book. It's available on Palace Project. Hope everyone just do it. You will feel lots of feelings and they will be worth feeling. Um, so for our final uh, speaker of the night, I'm going to introduce an old co-worker of mine, how time <laughs> flies, Marion Huggins, who's going to introduce our final author of the evening, Donnie Walton. Thank you so much, Kim. I enjoyed working with you and I enjoy seeing you in these events. This is fantastic. And Donnie Walton, your book was awesome, okay? It was one of the best books I ever read and I read a lot of books. Oh, um, so wow. I'm just gonna read your, your bio and then I'm gonna let you take over, okay? Okay. Donnie, <laughs> Donnie Walton is the author of The Final Revival of Opal and Nev winner of the 2022 Aspen Words Literary Prize, the VCU Cable First Novelist Award, and the Audie Award for Fiction. Her debut novel is also a finalist for the Mark Twain American Voice in Literature Award and was long listed for the 2022 Women's Prize for Fiction. It was also named one of the best books of 2021 by the Washington Post, NPR, Esquire, and former U.S. President Barack Obama. She's the co-founder and editorial director of URSA, an audio production company celebrating short fiction from underrepresented voices, and is the co-host of its accompanying podcast. Formerly an editor at Essence and Entertainment Weekly, she, was, she has received fellowships from McDowell and Tin House and an F MFA from the Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop. She was born and raised in Jacksonville and now lives in Brooklyn with her husband. Welcome, Donnie Walton. Marion, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kim, and everyone with the Connecticut State Library for selecting my book, Baby, my first novel <laughs> for this program. Um, libraries to me hold a very spe special place in my heart. Um, they have always been sacred and cherished havens. And so it's no coincidence that my narrator, Sunny, um, finds her local library br branch to be a place of self-discovery and empowerment and revelation. So a little bit about me. I am proudly Generation X. <laughs> I was born in 1976, which is five years after the height of the fictional Opal and Nev and the showcase concert that launches them into headlines. And I came of age in the early 90s, a different era of rock and roll run by skater boys and riot girls. So the Opal and Nev I wrote are closer to my parents' age, not mine. And yet writing this novel unlocked a deep nostalgia for me too. Just like Sunny, discovering those Opal and Nev records at her public library, I recall feeling certain music inside my body physically, like a building scream, like a dare. That fight or flight response that Sunny describes when hearing Opal and Nev is the same feeling I had when I came home from school one day in 1991, turned on MTV, and saw Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit video for the first time. Who was that scary guy in the striped t-shirt and the shroud of blonde hair? What was that A symbol on the cheerleaders' uniforms? Why were those kids thrashing in the high school gym and why was I so drawn to them was the biggest question for me. A lot of this novel for me was an exploration of what I missed about being very young and very caught up in everything having to do with music. I was thinking about my college years a lot, about Tuesday spent at a shop in Tallahassee, Florida, where I went to school called Vinyl Fever. By the time I came through Vinyl Fever, of course, no longer sold vinyl, but on Tuesdays, the staff made all the new CD re releases available for listening. I've thought about that and about the U section too, how my friends and I would flick through bins of those plastic jewel cases in search of gold. I thought about the agonizing choices forced by whatever little bit of money we had in our pockets, because CDs back then were like $20 a pop, which was a lot in college. And I thought about going home to pop my selected treasure into that little shelf stereo system. And I thought about how I used to clutch 
the lyrics books and sort of imprint the words while I was listening to the music. And then I thought back to the years before that, when I was a teenager in high school and I would spend Friday and Saturday nights um, at an all ages alternative rock club in my hometown of Jacksonville, it was called Einstein Agogo. Go. And there I found myself mingling inside a thrilling subculture of punks and goths, ravers, shoegazers, 24 hour party people. So yes, I loved feeling very connected to that music and those subcultures, but the older I got, the more I realized the complications I faced being part of them. For better and often for worse, music back then had a bearing on everything. Your friends group, your friend groups, your personal style, your worldview. So the questions it raised for me were, what did it mean that I love genres in which I was in which I very rarely saw reflections of myself as a Black woman? What did it mean that my musical proclivities back then seemed to define me in some way or seemed to spark other people's preconceived notions around who I was and how I chose to identify? It was actually another art form that helped me to parse some of those questions I've been asking myself. Specifically, there were two documentary films that are so influential on the birth of Opal and Nev, um, that this novel would not probably exist had I not seen them. The first one was James Spooner's indie movie documentary, Afropunk, uh, which I saw at a film festival in 2003, the year of its initial release. So by that time, at my big age of 27, of course I knew that I could love weird rock and still be Black. My undergraduate experience at an HBCU, Florida A&M, had been instrumental in helping me reconcile the pieces of myself that I had once been led to believe were incongruous. And of course, I knew that it was in fact Black artists, including Big Mama Thornton, Little Richard, Sister Rosetta Tharp, and Chuck Berry, who'd invented rock and roll in the first place. And yet, watching Afropunk sitting in that movie theater, hearing the personal stories of young brown and black punk and hardcore fans, I found myself on the verge of tears. Never before had any art so specifically seen me. In the fans James Spooner interviewed, I recognized their love of the music, yes, and the reasons why its raucous aesthetic appealed to them, but also it was a jolt to hear what those fans shared about the loneliness of their scenes the confusion and emotional toll of being the only Black person at the shows in their towns. These Afropunks, which was like, wow, a galvanizing name, finally. Um, they smiled and they joked about everything, even the bits that broke their hearts. And I recognized their rueful laughter. I, I knew what that was, that shrugging off of the disappointing and sometimes downright offensive things that some you know, white people in their circles could say. Before Afropunk, I hadn't quite known that there was this movement simmering. So many underserved Black fans of rock, in fact, that not long after the documentary made its rounds on the festival circuit, a digital message board community to connect them popped up. By then, I'd felt too old to participate actively, uh, but I certainly lurked on this alternative Black planet like a nosy big sister. And it was so much fun to watch those bonds form and that loneliness dissipate. And then one day, a few years later, I was walking through my old neighborhood in Brooklyn near the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and I stumbled upon the small stage and skate ramps that made up the inaugural Afropunk Festival. Now, today, Afropunk is very different. It's tweaked from that original vision that James Spooner had. It's pretty commercial endeavor now. It's a global brand that has festivals everywhere from Brooklyn to Paris and 1.1 million followers on Instagram. But what a revelation Afropunk was in 2005 at even a fraction of that size. Not necessarily the genesis of Opal Jewel, but the beginning of her possibility. It would be another 10 years before I'd see the documentary that fixed Opal in my mind for good. And that was 20 Feet from Stardom, directed by Morgan Neville. 
So that movie is about background singers, most of them Black women, who'd contributed vocals to some of the biggest pop and rock hits of our lifetimes, but had struggled to forge their own solo careers. Most folks who've seen the movie, and a lot of people I, I know have seen it, uh, probably a lot of people watching have seen it, um, they remember the story of Mary Clayton, whom the Rolling Stones roused out of bed late one night and asked to come to a recording studio in Los Angeles. She was pregnant at the time, uh, and Mary Clayton showed up to the studio in her house coat and her rollers, which is a really um, uh, memorable story from the movie. And in her duet with Mick Jagger, she belted out the strange lyrics she was given, scary stuff about rape and murder being just a shot away. Without her voice, 1970s song, Gimme Shelter, would not have had the same emotion and urgency. It would not conjure the darkness and volatility of the Vietnam era. And yet before this movie came out in 2013, few people knew Mary Clayton's name or what she looked like, or that the perform performance she'd given was so searing, so strenuous, that some have connected it to the miscarriage she suffered soon after, or that she'd later lend her gospel inflected vocals to the chorus of another song that surely must have held some scary darkness for her, Leonard Skinner's 1974 hit, Sweet Home Alabama. Now, Leonard Skinner is a band from my hometown, which is a whole other tangent that I don't, I can't talk about today, but um, people also didn't know that Mary Clayton would try a few times to put out her own albums, but she would never enjoy the breakout moment she deserved. Miss Clayton's story was the centerpiece of 20 Feet from Stardom, the climactic and perhaps most damning example of how rock and roll used Black talents but failed to properly support their careers. But even before her interview, five minutes into 20 Feet from Stardom, my creative synapses were going wild. In the introductory bits, Morgan Neville uses footage of background performers helping the megastars they support shine. And I recognized one of my favorite bands of all time, Talking Heads, from the concert film Stop Making Sense. There was the quirky David Byrne at center stage in his boxy gray suit, similar to the one he wore in the Once in a Lifetime video, and to his left, wearing gray short sets, micro braids, and bright red lipstick were two stunning Black women who matched his energy note for note. They were uninhibited in their joy. Carefully, carefree Black girls, we'd hashtag these sisters now. Their names, I'd later learn, are Lynn Mabry and Edna Holt. Over the years, they have sung backing vocals for everyone from Fleetwood Mac to Brian Ferry, but I wouldn't know that until I did more digging. In the moment of discovery, I could not take my eyes off them as they sang and they danced. And though in 20 feet from stardom, they're only on screen for a few seconds, not even interviewed like Mary Clayton was, I felt an urge to stick my hand inside the screen and nudge one of them towards center stage with David Byrne just to see what magic might happen. So for days afterward, I could not get this image out of my head. This novel then began with a series of what if questions that incited a nostalgia-like yearning, not for what was, but for what might have been. What if a duo like that had existed in my favorite era of rock and roll, the early 1970s, not with a Black woman playing background to a white man, but on equal footing with him, sharing the same spotlight? What if they defied the constraints of genre, blew past the gatekeepers, and enjoyed a flash of fame? And what if a young Black girl in need of a heroine, someone like me, discovered one in a boundary-busting Black rock and roll queen. Pulling attributes from Black women in music I admired, I riffed on the kind of icon I would have pinned to my bedroom wall in a second back then. And I planned Opal as an amalgamation of them. Because I grew up in the age of the music video, I thought about Opal's looks and image first. I saw the cutting edge style of Grace Jones, her reedy frame and ebony skin, the sharp angles daring you not to get too close, the cigarette dangling from her lips. 
I pictured Opal like Grace, scandalizing late night talk show hosts, playing versions of her wildest self in movies. But how would Opal sound? Like Tina Turner, her voice would not be pretty or sweet in any way. She would use her unique pipes to rasp, scream, grunt, hoot, roar, holler. Her stage show would be provocative and even acrobatic, like the glimpses I've seen of the woman on my t-shirt, if you can see it. This is Betty Davis, a 1970s funk queen and a songwriter and former model who'd been married to Miles Davis for one short year. But that year was long enough for her influence to nudge him out of bebop and into his electric era. Long enough too that when they broke up, he'd call her too wild for his taste, which is quite a thing for somebody like Miles Davis to have said. Most crucially though, how would Opal carry herself as a black artist in the world? Like Nina Simone, she would believe in her responsibility to reflect the times and be a fierce advocate for her community. Like Eartha Kitt, who once flipped a White House invitation from Lady Bird Johnson into an opportunity to protest the Vietnam War, she would speak truth to power despite the dire consequences it would pose to her career, despite the CIA dossiers compiled in her name. She would keep one eye on the future and always question who's watching the watcher, like the great singer-songwriter Nona Hendrix did in the 1976 LaBelle song of the same name. And speaking of LaBelle, she would galvanize as diverse a following as that trio, the first Black vocal group to make the cover of Rolling Stone. So suddenly this character in my head was growing larger than life ballooning to superhero proportions. But the problem is I'm too much of a skeptic for all that. As important as any of the other attributes I just mentioned, I wanted Opal Jewel to feel real. That meant injecting her with flaws and vulnerabilities and crosses she must bear and an ambition so huge it sometimes blinds her. I wanted to make her as messy as any other rock star, make her so human and fallible that I could love her through the moments she disappointed me. The world around Opal needed to be real too. I had to believe every beat of her story before I could convince you. That's why I use so much real American history as scaffolding, from the Great Migration to the tactics of J. Edgar Hoover to even the 2016 presidential election. And in part, my desire to keep Opal rooted in the realm of reality is partly the reason I gave her Nev as a musical partner. The sad truth is, I don't believe that a Black woman like Opal, no matter how talented or how magnetic, could have broken out on her own as a rock star as early as 1971. Not if solo success never happened for Mary Clayton that year, and certainly not if the legend Tina Turner, finally free of her abusive relationship with Ike in 1976, was considered a has-been until 1983. That's the year Tina's friend, David Bowie, brought execs from Capitol Records to her Las Vegas review and essentially pushed them despite strong opposition at the label, to give Tina the shot she'd been fighting for, a solo record deal. Imagine that, Tina Turner having trouble getting a solo record deal. The album she delivered for them, by the way, was a massive hit, Private Dancer, sold 12 million copies worldwide, garnered four Grammys, and cemented Tina's rare place in rock and roll history. The fact that Nev and Bob Highs, Opal and Nev's producer, are both British is also anchored in real history. Often, it was British artists who paid the most respect to the Black American blues and soul singers that, by their own admission, they'd spent their early careers emulating. The wild thing is, since this novel was published, I'm still learning about Black women who were either marginalized or totally erased from the rock scenes they helped to develop. While Opal and Nev was still in proofs, I learned of another Black woman rocker named Tina, Tina Bell, 
a Seattle native who fronted a pioneering grunge band called Bam Bam in the 1980s, but was cut out of the whole Seattle sound conversation that centered Pearl Jam, Nirvana, and other bands she'd clearly influenced. In the stories I devoured in my research about Tina Bell, there was even a legend about how once at a show, she'd taken on racist skinheads who called her the N-word by swinging a microphone stand around like a lasso and clocking one of them in the head, a scene eerily similar to one I had written in Opal and Nev. I was crushed to learn that Tina Bell died of cirrhosis in 2012 at just 55 years old after her failure to launch led to a long struggle with depression and alcoholism. She was gone years before I'd even heard her name. I hear stories like that and they put an ache in my heart, especially remembering myself as a young woman in that era, the late 80s and early 90s, and hungering to experience the music and performance and image of even just a few artists like Miss Bell. And so along with the other inspirations I named, my driving hope for this novel was that it could somehow pay tribute to the Black women in rock I already knew, as well as to those I still have to discover. I hope that Opal's journey might in some way capture their resilience and spirit and their unique contributions. That this story would say to them, as the Afropunk documentary once said to me, I see you, I celebrate you, I love you. And that's pretty much the inspiration. That's the heart of this book. And I'm I'm so excited to um, hear your questions. And thank you all for listening and showing so much love to this novel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marian. You're welcome. You know, I was I was listening. Well, I read the book when it first came out. I usually read the books a year ahead and then I bring them to the book club the next year. So when I have to read it the second time, I use audio and it was an ensemble cast in the audio. Yeah. It was amazing. It was like Virgil Lafleur. He's just my friend. OK, <laughs> <laughs> he's, you know, if he, yeah. If he was out now, he would be the biggest star. He would be the dresser of all the stars, right? Um, the book is so deep on so many levels. Um, Sonny Shelton or Saralina Curtis, yes. the fact that she has two identities is deep enough, right? But a lot of the book is from her perspective, but yet there were things that she could not see. Like she couldn't see Opal's time in France. She couldn't see Nev's time in England. I guess she could have read about it. You want to talk more about that, how her point of view was developed? Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so Sunny, funny enough, is a character that did not come into the story until I'd written about two thirds of a full draft. Um, the book initially was just the straight oral histories the editor that was putting it together was invisible, not part of the story whatsoever. And when I went to graduate school at the University of Iowa and started workshopping the novel, you know, my classmates said, you know, we love this. We think this is really fun. But our question for you is who is everybody talking to? Mm -hmm. Because the book is so much about performance. And so there's this idea that as people are telling their stories, they're doing a bit of performance themselves. And so who is that audience? Mm -hmm. And that really made me think that, oh, here's an opportunity to create a character and sort of inject her into the story in a really interesting way. And this is not a spoiler to say because it's the first paragraph of, of the book, um, but Sunny has a very personal and painful connection to the birth of Opal and Ned, which is that her father um, was their drummer and he's killed um, during Rivington Showcase, which is sort of the the um, the concert that launches Opal and Nev into notoriety. And so, you know, writing once once I thought, OK, am I really going to do this? Because it was a major change for the book. You know, then I had to sort of think of Sonny being on the other side of the recorder 
And it required me to go all the way back to the beginning and write that opening editor's note and everything. But it also, the creation of Sunny helped to instantly kind of bring in a present storyline because suddenly you can picture not only the characters in the past as they're telling their stories, but in the present and think about what they might have at stake. And it sort of allowed me to close or close the loop is a wrong phrase, but sort of make connections, I guess between the present and, and, and the past. And personally, you know, I worked as a journalist for many years in entertainment journalism at magazines. And so mm. it was a little bit fun for me as a writer to kind of tap into um, that part of my experience. And a lot of the sunny material is kind of personal for me. Mm. You know, it's... Um, I didn't realize how close it was until, um, you know, I was writing the book and drafting and my husband was reading it as, as I was doing it. And he was like, okay, wait a minute, your name is Johnny and her name is Sunny. Like, yes, that's very close. And I hadn't even realized that I had done that. Um, so yeah, the sun, you know, Sunny kind of, I think changed the whole vibe of the book and really kind of, I think, made it a lot more layered and interesting. And also, right. honestly, that present storyline, as I was writing it, the presidential election was unfolding. And it was also a way for me to kind of process it. Um, I was deep into the drafts <laughs> on election night in 2016. And um I remember calling my mother very upset and her kind of reminding me, you know, that there have been dark times, you know, before. And so like kind of, it just was kind of all coming together in a really magical, interesting, provocative way. I see a question from Marguerite. Um, it says, it was important that Nev was three-dimensional too. He had to have yeah. mixed motives. Can you speak to Nev's character and motivations? Thank you so much, Marguerite, for that question. Yeah. Um, it's been so interesting um, to hear different people's reactions to Nev. You know, I get a lot of people there say, oh, I can't stand him. I hate Nev. The fact is, is that like I, Nev makes terrible mistakes and without spoiling anything too much for people who are still reading it, um, I will say his biggest flaw, which is also Opal's biggest flaw as well, is ambition. They are both hugely ambitious, except the difference is Opal's a Black woman, Nev is a white man, and so Opal and her ambition has a lot more at stake. And Opal feels when she is in the spotlight that she is carrying her community with her because of the person that she is. And so there are bridges that she will not cross. There are things that she will not do. And Nev's ambition is such that he will do almost anything. That's how much he wants it. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I often felt sad for Nev. Mm -hmm. And I do think as a character, um, I think like I always felt like I wanted him to be hugely talented with a lot of promise, but also just kind of lost. Um, and in a sense, not having the same kind of community that Opal has kind of leads him to some, some dark places and to some very selfish, self-interested places. I was also thinking about Nev as a chameleonic figure. You know, we talk about these, a lot of white male rock stars, we think about like the chameleon figure and how we see they're allowed to kind of have different phases of their careers and, and change their sound and their image. Um, and I thought, you know, well, what, what, what does that mean? Like how changeable does that make a person's spirit or their soul? Um, and so it was, that was kind of like where I was coming from with the, with the Nev character. Yeah. So I see Kim is back on. Does that mean we're out of time? Yeah, or is... We, we are, which is breaking my whole entire heart. I, Donnie, I feel like the millennial version of you were sort of your, your music interest in particular 
tell a message about you, which might be part of the message that you want to share with the people around you, but not the only message. Oh my gosh, I resonated. I'm I'm downloading the audiobook. We have it on Palace. Let me get it first. Um, because I'm a big audiobook fan and Marion just raving about that did it. That that was all I needed to hear. Oh, I so, hope you enjoy it. Oh, I will. Oh, I will. I'm you don't know this, but I know that you actually wrote this book for me. You too, but like I think uh, so. that's that's how I that's think. what that was the goal. It was. That was the goal. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Donnie, for being here and giving us some of your time. Congratulations on the final revival of Opal and Nev. Miriam, thank you so much for being such a fantastic host and, and question asker. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight for our second annual All CT Reads Author Launch. Give us about seven-ish days to get the recordings processed and chopped up, and they will be available on the website. Share Donnie's talk and everyone else's with your book clubs, with your library patrons. Just watch it again, because I'm probably going to, and also 20 Feet from Stardom. What a movie. Um, thank you again to Don and Deborah, our fearless leaders who put so much support behind this initiative. And um, we'll talk to you all soon.